Hi, I'm Rosemary Cruzado and I would like to share with you the story of my involvement with the 12 tribes and what I have learned about cults and mind control especially. I hope you can gain something from this, maybe an insight into what a loved one is going through as a member, or maybe a warning to avoid someone getting stuck in the first place. If you are an ex-member of the TT, I hope you will find this helpful too, even that your experience might be quite different from mine. I'm more than welcome comments and ideas and just anyone sharing their own experience with me. As we share our experiences with each other, we find understanding and healing. I'll give you first the rundown of this presentation, first the introduction, my background, the day we met the TT, definition of the word cult, mind control and brainwashing. Then they are fishing and we are the fish. The bait tastes good, we want some more. More bait, the gospel according to the TT, getting hooked. We swallow the hook, the line and the sinker. Lift and eight criteria for thought reform, mystical manipulation, milieu control, the loading of the language, the demand for purity, sacred science, the cult of confession, dispensive of existence, and then my conclusion, and then I'll speak of uh, what's inspired me, my sources. I will tell my story of my involvement with the TT in a few minutes, but I want to talk of my background first. My parents are both from the Atlantic shore of a northern region of Spain called Cantabria. Capital is Santander. My dad's father was in the military and the family lived in a dairy farming village near the ocean. My dad was born in 1930. In 1936 started the Spanish Civil War which began as a fight from the people to be sovereign and reconstitute a republic. My mom's dad being a republican was hunted down and executed by Franco's army. My mom was then just three years old. Her mom died just one year later, leaving seven children to fend for themselves. Her family had everything taken from them because of their political involvement, so these were hard times. Franco, backed by Hitler, won against his own people. His dictatorial regime lasted until early 70s. The three pillars of his regime were the Roman Catholic Church, his army and the centuries-old monarchy. My parents, like many other Spaniards, opted to migrate in the late 50s to a more free and progressive country and chose France. They got married in Paris and this is where me and my brother and sister were born and grew up. My dad was a mechanic and my mom a homemaker and mum. I grew up identifying both as a Spaniard and a Parisian girl. I grew up happy living in the same suburb of Paris, enjoying learning at school and looking forward to my holidays in the village where my dad had grown up near one of the beautiful northern beaches. I greatly enjoyed being in the country and have wonderful child memories. My parents loved us and provided me and my two siblings with the best opportunities they could. They encouraged us greatly to study and advance in life. I was a very curious and active child and an avid reader. These stories prove to me you can't always trust your government nor your established religion. At school I also heard of the First and Second World War. I heard of the Inquisitions and the Crusades perpetrated against countless people all over Europe and in the Middle East. I also heard of the colonizations and how the Christian religion was used to steal natives of their ancestral traditions, beliefs and lands. For a while I was even ashamed of being white. I thought there must be something terribly flawed in our race. But I judged Christianity as having perpetrated crimes against humanity and therefore had decided to never place my trust in anything Christian. My parents had no affiliation to any church or group and allowed us to form our own judgments and beliefs. After high school, I completed an associate's degree in international commerce with trilingual capacity. I worked for a while for a vehicle freight company. I was at the beginning of my adult life feeling like a whole system was closing up on me to absorb me. I felt as if I didn't give myself a chance to experience life. I might never really get to know myself or what life is really about and I would regret it something was calling me out of Paris. So I was almost 23 when I decided to travel to Australia by myself. I just told my family I was going soon. They didn't understand why, but respected my choice. 
As I didn't qualify for a working visa, I had only a short tourist visa, and so that greatly curtailed my work opportunities. But I loved being in Sydney. I traveled up to northern Queensland, hitchhiking with a friend. I returned to Sydney and lived in a vegetarian communal home in Paddington. This was my first experience in communal living and also with new religions as many of the residents were getting in or out of various Eastern groups or were part of the New Age hippie movement. These were lovely people and I loved the scene and learned so much. Two guys in there were making futons and selling them. As their spiritual journey were calling them elsewhere, they needed someone to continue with a small home-based business. And so I quickly learned and took it on. Sadly, this experience was abruptly interrupted half a year later. One beautiful evening, three immigration officers turned up at our doorsteps. My visa had run out and they had successfully tracked me down. I managed to escape them though. I ended up settling in the Blue Mountains and lived off making and selling futons again in Katumba. Compared to that enriching communal lifestyle, my life was pretty boring now. But there was quite a few people part of alternative movements and new religions, as well as musicians, artists. I was settling and making friends. So it is in Katumba in 1989 that Mark and I first met. He's originally from New Zealand, from Eastern European background. He had worked as a professional drummer and in different trade, but he was kind of having a break from everything at that time. It was love at first sight and we were quickly committed to a relationship that has endured and grown until now. We had two children, Undila, born in 1990, and Abraham, born in 93. We moved from Katoomba to northern New South Wales. Our search for stable employment took us to Brisbane, then we spent two years in Spain and Paris. In 1996, five months after our return from overseas, is when we met the 12 tribes. So we had my husband and I more than love and two beautiful children. We had a lot in common. Mark caught the end of the hippie era in New Zealand and I had the nostalgia like I had just missed the boat. A spiritual revolution just happened, a time to soar and seek new horizons. We both were seeking to live a more fulfilling and sustainable life. We assumed responsibility for our health and had a back-to-nature approach to life. We were both vegetarians. We both had been in contact with different Eastern new religions. Both disliked Christianity and never joined any religion, neither old nor new. And we were still seeking a deeper meaning to our lives. Our first child was born at home and the second one at the hospital being a natural birth. We were paying off some undeveloped forested piece of land up in Queensland and dreamed of living on the land one day, preferably in a communal setting. We contemplated homeschooling. Back in Sydney, we were living in Kuji, and I had found a small alternative school for our children. Mark started finding work as a tradesman here and there, and I was working a bit, and then doing different courses and considering doing a long one on permaculture. Our relationship had matured a lot through all the things we had gone through together. We got on really well together and the occasional argument we thought was just part of it as we never had the expectation life would be perfect either way you had it. And our children were smart, healthy and lively and got on well together. They were our pride and joy. Life was pretty simple then. Having gone for a walk at the festival in Newtown in Sydney in October 1996 Mark was approached by a hippie looking lady. Mark, on this beautiful Saturday afternoon, was wearing shorts and sandals, a vest open showing his chest. His hair was to his shoulders and wore an earring and sunglasses. The lady walking around with pamphlets gave him one called A Brotherhood of Man and an invitation also with a map to the farm and said to him, smiling most kindly, You look like you need a home. We both sat and read and were quite impressed. Later we visited and shortly after decided to move in to find out more about their life and message. The oldest meaning of cult encompasses the rituals, festivals, traditions and cultural lifestyles centered on the worship of a particular god or deity. For example, you can research the cult of a god called Dionysus in Greece, or the cult of Shiva in India, or the cult of the Virgin Mary in Europe. 
In our modern world, many famous artists have been the object of adoration, close or equal to that given by others to go their gods. You can find, for example, a YouTube channel called Cult of Gaga, where ecstatic devoted followers of Lady Gaga are invited to join the cult. Dictators like Mussolini and Stalin instituted themselves as the object of cult, and so historians speak of the cult of the personality of those leaders, which was an intentional an essential part of the repressive regimes. Generally speaking, cult and sect are two words identical in meaning, which is a new religious group or group breaking away from a larger or more established religious group or religion. I don't think there can ever be an end to the debate of religion versus cult or sect. Depending on who is speaking, the word cult and sect will have a good, neutral or negative connotation. To some, Worship, cult and religion are in essence the same, and trying to make a significant distinction is preposterous. Some say that a cult or sect, when it becomes larger or more accepted, becomes a denomination or religion. To some others, any other form of worship apart from the one they practice is wrong, deviant or plain evil. Some believe that God is the only true one. Others worship one God or different gods and accept that others have other gods. Now, the word cult or sect is used in place of destructive group. This is how I use this word. First used to qualify religious destructive groups, it has come to include any destructive groups of any order, be it pseudo-scientific, pseudo-medical, pseudo-spiritual, political, commercial or corporate, according to Ixa which is International Cultic Studies Association, this is how you can define a destructive cult. A group or movement exhibiting a great or excessive devotion or dedication to some person, idea or thing and employing unethically manipulative techniques of persuasion and control, for example isolation from former friends and family, debilitation, use of special methods to heighten suggestibility and subservience, powerful group pressures, information management, suspension of individuality or critical judgment, promotion of total dependency on the group, and fear of leaving it, etc. All designed to advance the goals of the group's leaders, to the actual or possible detriment of members, their families or the community. Cults have been around forever, but in our modern times they started flourishing in the 60s and 70s, they have since been the subject of much debate and study, and some definite observations have been made. Cults can start with only two people, one worshipping and being subservient to the other. Cults are not static, they evolve. Destructive characteristics can appear in any given group, religion or ideology. For instance, all it takes sometimes is a pastor getting enlarged ideas about his ministry and being convinced of the exclusivity of his message of truth. He might have a particular charisma and bring his congregation to follow his own brand of Christian doctrine. The sheep subjugated are convinced that he alone is the true emissary of God. They allow him into their most private lives and let him dictate everything from who is their right partner to how they should treat their relatives. This might lead to separations and divorces but it's good, because according to this pastor, those people are a hindrance for them to find the kingdom of God. Cults cover and use all ranges of human interactions and interests, from psychoanalysis, UFOs, old traditions, diets, spiritual practices such as meditation, yoga, politics, medicine, commerce, personal or professional advancement, magic, spirit world, life after death. They very often hide behind fronts that could be anything from drug rehabilitation centers, benevolent or humanitarian organizations, vocational training, etc. etc. There is not one country exempt from cults and millions have been caught. Millions are victims. The most powerless ones are the children growing up in a cultic world. And today, some of them are not only second, but third, fourth, fifth, even sixth generation cult members. Before I get on to...